18 presidential candidates will participate in Nigeria's polls on February 25. The new president will be sworn in on the 29th of May and will be constitutionally mandated to manage Nigeria's security, governance, architecture between 2023 and 2027. Now, this election, the seventh since the country's return to democracy in 1999, will be significantly uh, impacting our polit uh, policy direction. Now, over the past seven years, government has invested over 12 trillion naira, that's about $26.5 billion uh, in military assets, expanded the armed forces and focused on degrading violent extremist groups in the northeast of the region. However, public, uh, public safety and security in Nigeria are still in a bad place. And so joining us to discuss this evening is Charles Otu, who's a political analyst, and we're going to be looking at um, the campaign promises of the different presidential aspirants and, of course, um, what they have to say about security. Mr. Otu, it's so good to have you join us. Happy New Year. I wish you the best. Thank you so much for having me. Great. Now, obviously, you, you are in the part of the country where there seems to be a lot of heat um, um, when it comes to violence, whether it be electoral violence or... Um, you know, uh, insecurity, um, ethnic, you know, um, uprisings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Especially um, in Imo states, there's been a lot of burning of INEC facilities, killing, kidnappings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It seems to be unending. And um, the people obviously are looking to government. And when I talk about government, they we're looking at governments at state and federal levels. But what seems to be the body language of these, our leaders, in terms of the insecurity that we're facing as a country? Thank you very much. The, uh, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the fact that we are no longer looking up to the government that is at the center at the moment, whom we ought to have been looking towards till at least May 29, 2023, when they would have handed over. Uh, the fact is simple. Uh, the government has chosen to believe what it wants to believe. It has also chosen to act the way it wants to act. And I feel the actions and the inactions towards security or the insecurity in the country at large, and particularly in the southeast, is deliberate. Uh, how do I mean? If you will take a, a cursory look at the promises of the government on security, uh, during your news review, you mentioned very succinctly that over 12 trillion naira has been spent on tackling the security challenges in the country. That is about the largest budget any government will, 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 will offer or provide or propose for fighting insecurity since the return of democracy in 1995. Uh, the government we knew took off from 2015 with a promise to wrestle to the ground the very pertinent security challenge we had in the country then, or certainly only because that is the northeastern part of the country. And today, the government, by its actions and inactions, have multiplied the security situation. When I say it has, it has multiplied, I mean the government has been deliberate about it. For instance, my dear sister, today is Monday. I just came back from a trip. It was difficult to make that trip as early as proposed, simply because. There are rumors about sit at home. So people will now wake up in the southeast to say, look, today people are not going to anywhere. They are not, they are not going about their normal business. And you see hoodlums hijack the situation to unleash mayhem. So what would have happened? Would, should we have been talking about a Monday sit at home in the southeast as it is today, for instance, if the government had not held Nam the camp virtually in custody? even against the cost of the land. The answer is outright no. You move away from the, the, the case in the southeast, you move to the other parts of the country where the incidents of uh, kidnappings here and there, even the heading of uh, the local government chairman of Imo State, this has become like, um, you know, criminality has been taken to a whole new level. What is the issue? The challenge is simply because the youths are angrier, the unemployment rate has increased from the, the, the figure it was as about, 20, as about 2015 to an unimaginable level. I don't want to quote the MBS figures because they are scary. Mm. So, but are the realities we are facing in the country. So the security situation 
in the country today for the insecurity plaguing Nigeria today is directly proportional or cost by the actions and inactions of the government. The inability to provide the jobs that they promised the youths, the inability to meet up with the expectations of the populace is increasing the restiveness in the country generally. And that is where we are today. I'm, I'm most curious um, because you see, w we talk about you know, the statistics that have been rolled out. I remember uh, just at the close of 2022, I, I ran through um, some of the events, the major events that happened in 2022. And, I, and surprisingly, from January to, through to December, uh, in fact, the year started on a very rough note where we had killings and slaughtering and massacres, you know, all the way down to the end. I mean, the, the only good thing that we could have positively pointed to was the passing of the PIB, the Electoral Act, and of course, the young lady, Tobia Muson, who broke a 16-year-old world record. Apart from that, all that we recorded in this country was one mayhem, one violence, one killing, one negativity after the other. And it makes me wonder where we all as Nigerians come in here because, uh, yes, the box stops at the t table of our governors, our presidents, our legislators. But how well have we held our own as the people who seem to be victims of these, uh, you know, perpetration of violence or, you know, um, killings? What are we doing um, to make sure that our leaders are accountable to us as opposed to just talking about it and reeling out these statistics? Thank you very much. The answer from my end, as I've um, watched over the past uh, uh, nearly eight years of the Buhari administration, the answer from my end is simple. We are doing nothing, and absolutely nothing. Why? Because some of these security and citizens, Miriam, you will agree that they have been forecasted. The attack on Ikenga of uh, Ikenga Goshiri, Nimo State, for instance, some people had boasted about it publicly. Some of these incidents were fulfilled. The killing of uh, Reverend Father Ashi in Kaduna State, for instance, is something that is foretold. This is a man who had been, in the past couple of years, been hunted by bandits, by all manner of armed militia. Just because he's sticking to a fate. What have we done? What the security agencies do at the time is to react to the circumstances not to be proactive about them. And uh, it, it behoves when you just suppose all of this with the fact that the, 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 the northern hegemony, hegemony as it were, particularly the Fulani hegemony, the Fulani leaders who are piloting the affairs of this country as it were now, have stuck their guns, they have stuck to their guns to say, look, that the IGP must be returned. You must have had the new headlines yesterday, even today, that the police uh, service commission is saying they are not aware of the extension of the, the tenor of the IGP. These are... Mr. Tua, are you there? Uh, incidents. Uh, I, I think they were having a connection problem with you. Can, can you hear me? I can hear you. All right, go ahead, please. Uh, these are, these are clear-cut incidents where the... The, the president should, should have tried to re redeem his image and rescue the country from further security damage by just asking the IGP, Isma Baba Ahmed, whose tenor has aspired to step aside. His tenor has aspired, you're extending his stay in office. Is it on what grounds? Has he performed? The answer is downright no. The police, as it were, which is the basic the security fulcrum, according to the Constitution, rests squarely on the federal government because we are not operating state police as it were. It still rests squarely, not only on the federal government, the president, it still rests squarely on the IGP. The question is what has the federal police done about all the security incidents, breaches that have been reported across the country? Campaigns have started, Marianne. As we speak, I am in a point. That part of the country where people that are perceived not to be spokespersons of government cannot talk, cannot campaign, and there have been pockets of incidents of violence. Hmm. Not one, not two, almost on a daily basis. Many petitions, several petitions have been written to the IGP. Why is the IGP not, not de de deploying the, the, the Commissioner of Police in a point, in a time like this? Because the, the Commissioner of Police is simply a full animal, like himself. 
And that is why these things are the way they are in the state and the country at large. So you're, so you're telling me that the reason why we're having these problems is because ethnicity has found its way into security? Absolutely. I'm trying to understand this. What does, the, uh, what does where uh, the okay. IGP come from or where the commissioner of police comes from have to do with how security issues are being handled within the state? What does that, what does that have to do with anything? It has so much to do. Uh, we, we've heard that... The, the governor of Ebony, for instance, posts severally publicly that as far as the IG is there, the CP cannot be removed. So those of us who are Ebonians, who have marched across the streets, who have protested the writings, who have spoken up, sp spoken up about the activities of a militia, for instance, we are wondering what is so difficult about bringing in a CP from another state. There was a time, you, Marianne, you must have heard in the news that a CP from Kano was to be redeployed to Ebony. You must have heard the news. Few days after the, the plan was pushed, the CP was returned. So when political actors act like this, it, they are acting in cahoots with the uh, uh, security authorities, and that was squarely on the IGP. So what we have done is political patronage. We patronize people because we are, they, are, they are from our clans. We patronize people not on the basis of competence, but on the basis of what we stand to gain as individuals. That is why the security situation in this country is not going to improve, even as we go into the election. Hmm. That's Talk, talking about the elections, let's look at the different political, um, um, the presidential candidates, um, some of the frontline runners. Uh, let's start with the APC. Now, uh, Tinubu's manifesto builds on the APC successes at the national level. I'm wondering what those are. Um, he proposes, I, I want to quote his manifesto directly, he proposes extending the ongoing security sector reforms by redefining Nigeria's military doctrine, one. And uh, he also wants to upgrade weapon systems to establish anti-terrorist battalions, improve soldiers' welfare, and revitalize the forest and border guards. Uh, quickly, let's look at all those things that are put, put out. How does this address the, the problem that we have right now in the interim? If he were to be president today, and these are the steps that he wants to take in addressing insecurity. What does that change? Uh, th there's no sentiment, my dear sister, about the fact that, apart from the incoherency and inability to pin down issues to specifics in the vague, very vague manifesto of uh, the APC presidential candidate, Bola the fact remains that the APC as it were, the APC presidential candidate as it were, has no blueprint of his own. That is the truth. If you read what he has proposed on security, people have been questioning, how many police officers are you going to recruit? Are you, or are you just telling us you're going to get some 1,000 soldiers and feed them with uh, Agbado and Cassava and all of that? In specifics, what are you going to do to unbundle even the, even the issue of state police, for instance? He's not talking about it. He's not talking about... The, 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 the fact that, look, the police service commission, as it were, has become so handicapped that you, you could imagine where the, the, the president and commander in chief, we, we know it is his constitutional duties and right hmm. to extend or to extend the, 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 the tenor of the CP, to elongate the, the tenor of the inspector general police. But then it must be on the basis of what is fair, what is just, what is equitable, what okay. is civil called competence and capability. What has the IGP done and achieved in the last couple of years? This, when uh, uh, Mr. Tinubu, um, Abola Metinubu is talking about building on the security accession that is in place, I want him to know that there is nothing in place. Hmm. Okay, let's quickly nothing go to... Let's, let's, quick, let's quickly... Be, because we don't have time, let's quickly run through... Yeah, let's quickly run through Atiku's and then, of course, that of Peter Abi. For... for um, the PDP, which is uh, former Vice President Atiku Abubakar, um, his manifesto was very scant in detail and, and lacked a lot of action plan against banditry, terrorism, and kidnapping. Um, it also didn't really necessarily talk a lot about Nigeria's primary national security threats. However, it does make some bold commitments. I'd like to put you through it. Atiku has promised to increase the size of the police force by more than 70% in line with the international standards. He has also said that he's going to commit to strategic engagements with state and non-state actors uh, to remove policing from exclusive, that's the federal, 
to the concurrent federal and subnational list. Overall, Atiku is saying that in his proposal, um, um, he's going to do a lot in terms of unbundling, you know, um, our police. But is that enough? Again, if we were to give him the mandate right now, what will it change? Uh, uh, for me, absolutely nothing will change. But the, but, the man has, but the man has said that he's going to um, increase if we decide policing to believe, by 70%. Yeah, in, in unbundling the, the in, in saying he will unbundle the security architecture in the country, which is, he's going to make state police a possibility. Yes, these are promises, they are good, they are fine proposals. But my dear sister, we read and we should continue to read these candidates by their antecedents. What has Atiku done, even in the past couple of years? Just a few months ago, a few, few months ago, or about a year ago, as it here, we know about how the border was slaughtered and how Atiku rushed to delete his tweet condemning the uh, killing of uh, the border by jihadist uh, Fulani Muslims in uh, Sokoto. The truth is that, based on Atiku's antecedents, Anybody, any Nigerian who is believing the proposals he has made on security is living analysis in a wonderland, and the person will be presently disappointed. Because we've seen the antecedents of uh, these persons regarding the safety and security of Nigerians, as it were, generally. So for me, it is all good in paper, but Atiku doesn't have the political will. Okay. He doesn't have the political will. To act as he has proposed his proposal. Finally, because I have just a minute, um, let's look at Peter B's manifesto. Now, the Labour Party's um, alternative is to, um, well, they're blending security and national cohesion and inclusive governance as their theme. Now, it raises a lot of questions about, you know, the grasp of the severity of Nigeria's security woes. Um, Obi actually acknowledges banditry, terrorism, and organized crimes at, as, you know, central to Nigeria's insecurity, but his most significant commitment is to extensive reform of Nigeria's police to allow all subnational units to establish and control own also their policing teams. Other proposals, again, like others, are vague and indistinguishable uh, from the current government's policies. So, again, the three candidates do agree, you know, that Nigeria has multidimensional threats to statehood and proposed different interventions. But then most of these interventions seem vague to us. So again, if this is the major problem that Nigeria is facing, insecurity, and of course on the other side we have corruption and all kinds of other problems, how are we certain that these people will be able to solve our problems on any level? Well, on the put of this manifesto, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit not excited, but realistic to say that I'm not also impressed by his proposal on security. You know, when uh, these candidates are talking and they are not giving us the exact figures, they all keep us in the dark. Yes, Obi has promised a reform, a general sectoral reform in the Nigerian police force, and um, you know, security on bonding and all of that. These are very beautiful proposals, my dear sister. But the truth also remains that at no instance have we seen the specifics, even in the campaigns. The campaigns, the public campaigns and public rallies that have been going on across the 30 states of the country has more or less been the not very far from the, not too far from the usual throwing of jobs. We expected that these candidates will, as they visit the Northeast, make specific promises on how they will intend to tackle Boko Haram as different from the kidnapping for ransom and rampant killings that is going on in the Southeast. I don't know if you, know if you understand me. Yes. But One also expected that these other candidates, other the candidates should be able to, you know, extrapolate the different issues surrounding the security in Nigeria and be able to address them region by region, zone by zone, and then even state by state. Because they, there are peculiarities in Imo and their boy, for instance. Ebubaku is terrorizing people. Yeah. They are not doing so in Anambra and Benugu. 
How are you going to address that if you become the president? I, th I think this is a conversation that we have to have again. Unfortunately, time is also on our side. But then, of course, if, if as, as people, we have to ask these questions. We have to be certain that they are able to tell us how they're going to go about it and not just tell us, you know, uh, something that is a bit blanket and vague. But I want to say thank you. Charles Otu is a political analyst and uh, he joined us live from Ebony. Thank you so much for speaking with us tonight. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank All you right. for having me. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Well, that's it on Plus Politics tonight. But before I go quickly, I would like to give you my take. Here's my take. Clarity is such an understated feature that is non-existent in our politics. That is not to be mistaken for accountability. Now, we talk about lack of accountability from our politicians because their time in office seems to be one complicated magic trick that no one is paid to watch. It's not entertaining and it leaves us feeling so exhausted at the end of their tenure. The great magicians actually convince you to look in one direction while the trick is going on elsewhere. Now, when it comes to governance, at the very least, you know, the application phase of seeking the job, what we need is and what we deserve is clarity. Remember back in school when your math teacher would demand that you show your work for the solution uh, to the completed equations? Well, that is the same that is required here. Having politicians who may not be experts on security, or in our case, in security, come out with platforms that is anything but clear on how they intend to solve the biggest issue of our national or state of affairs is purely unacceptable. They have the luxury of handpicking a team of professionals they intend to go into office with and consult experts on academics who can draft recommendations and reports on issues that we face. Now, without clarity on this basic homework that they're allowed to have others do for them, how audacious must they come to, for a job interview when they're so unprepared? So ask yourself the next time you want to vote for a person or you're trying to fight and lose your head over a politician. How ready are these guys to lead us into the future that we want? I am Mary Annacle, thanking you for watching. Good night.